Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Ag Forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions, your premier platform for real-time global insights. Well, with the jet stream relatively far to the north and, and quite zonal, meaning west to east in its flow, weather patterns across the United States over the last few days have been relatively benign. And this is just a snapshot yesterday, midday of our cloud field. You know, when you rewind the last three days and just take a look at total accumulated precipitation, we just had a little bit here in parts of the northeastern U.S. and also coming into the Puget Sound in parts of the Pacific Northwest. Outside of that, much of the Canadian prairies getting through the United States here, relatively uneventful, which is good. So what we're watching in the near term is what's left over from Hurricane Ada. Now, a few days ago, Hurricane Ada rapidly intensified, central pressure dropping 54 millibars in 24 hours, which makes that one of the most rapidly intensifying you know, hurricanes we actually have on record. And it slammed into Central America. And there's a lot of, of course, elevation change in Central America, which makes it extremely vulnerable to the flooding effects of a slow moving system like this. Many of us uh, were thinking back to the last time this was hit by such a powerful system, uh, which would have been Hurricane Mitch in 1998. And uh, that particular system killed somewhere between 12,000 and 18,000 people. So this is a pretty serious situation happening right now in Central America. Well, eventually what is circulating here with Hurricane Ada is going to come back out into the Caribbean. And I'm going to turn to the European model to kind of get an idea on where this might go. So what you've got over here in the background is the latest European ensemble forecast. And the models have really kind of honed in on a potential path that's going to do something like this. Now, at this point, there's little evidence that Ada is going to re-strengthen into a powerful system. You can even see the National Hurricane Center and the map that's on the right keeping it at tropical storm status. But some of the questions loom is what's going to happen once it gets right here into the Gulf of Mexico? Because some of the model runs just keep it there, allowing it to sit and spin and not strengthen too much, but possibly just bring some heavy precip to parts of Florida and then along the Gulf Coast. It'll be the timing of some front sweeping through the United States that will ultimately determine when and where this system gets kind of picked up into the main flow. But it's going to be something we'll be talking about through much of next week. Okay, stepping back and thinking about bigger picture things, I want to show you a, a map that looks back over the last month at the flow at the jet stream level. Now, what I've color coded for you here are called zonal winds, which means those west to east winds. The jet stream pattern has largely been this. Okay, so just kind of follow the drawing I'm doing here. It's really gone in a direction something like that, featuring a rather large ridge across the western United States. And our weather systems have kind of come down on this flow, invading, bringing very cold air through the Canadian prairie, the northern plains of the United States, and parts of the Pacific Northwest. But what I'm, I'm mostly intrigued by is this, this large area in through here where we have had very weak winds compared to normal. Now that is honestly a telltale sign of a developing La Nina, which we know we've been talking about. But right in through here specifically, these weak zonal winds have really eliminated the early effects of uh, the subtropical jet stream. And that has really played out in this map here. You see, when you look back over the last 30 days at the percent of normal precipitation, we would have expected at this point to have a few weather systems that have gone through California into Arizona, into, you know, Nevada. And at that, you know, those strong subtropical winds could aid in the return of moisture to this area. Instead, we've been very dry. Some places they're not picking up any precipitation. We've been relying on systems coming down like this, and you're even going to see that in the forecast, to increase our chances of precip in the Pacific Northwest as well. So we've largely avoided the zonal flow that's been targeting California. And that's just something I'd like to point out here as we get into the beginning of this video. So what this has got me thinking about is this map. So we're going to get a brand new drought monitor later on today. So this is the one from last week. And what I'm concerned about here is if the long term forecast through the, this winter does not return the subtropical jet stream to really take aim on California, the probability of us relieving drought in this section of the United States is going to be relatively low this winter. I do believe given the La Nina setup that this area will certainly be getting plenty of precipitation. And I even expect the Northern Rockies to really pack up quite a bit of snow. But the one area that I'm going to be watching carefully will be this region as we get into spring as it's an important factor for the Great Plains and also the Midwest for our uh, upcoming spring and summer precipitation patterns. So we got to keep a close eye on this for the next several months. 
In the near term, we do have today and tomorrow, those are the maps on the left and right, a few areas we're watching for fire risk. And the main concern there is going to be the dry conditions plus some stronger winds. So this next map here, this next animation, is going to show you accumulated maximum wind gusts. So we just kind of keep adding them up. And what I want you to notice is as we work our way into the day tomorrow on Friday, right here in parts of the Great Basin, we're going to be seeing some very strong winds. Now there's a low that's coming here, a deep upper level low that's sliding down into the Pacific Northwest and eventually here into the Intermountain West that will eject over the weekend into the Northern Plains. So you notice if you go from Saturday morning to Saturday afternoon and evening, we start to see the effect of this drawing in wind out of the south right here in the central plain. So strong winds here. But you can also see, look at parts of Arizona and Utah. Very, very strong winds. Going from there forward, this is now working our way into Sunday morning, afternoon, and evening. A couple of things to think about. We will expect to see through the plains very, very strong winds. But these strong winds on the back side here, well, there'll also be some snow in this area as the system comes through. And these will be blizzard um, strength winds in this particular region. So with that as the setup, let's go right now to the upper levels of the atmosphere. And if I could just tell you what I want you to watch, it's going to be this. Our pattern continues to be amplified. The jet stream is doing something like this. And so systems are going to keep coming in from this direction, and they're going to try to come through, but they can't get past this ridge. So with that as kind of what I want you to watch, watch it together with me. Ready? Press and play here going through this weekend. You can see the lows forming and reforming in the western United States all the way through next weekend. But we still continue to see broad ridging across the east. And that means as these systems dive down, like the one you see here on Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon and evening, it keeps getting reinforced with troughs on the back side, which doesn't allow the system to kick east. Instead, it gets pulled back toward the north. So the trajectory on the low pressure centers I'm about to share with you here in the next animation, they keep getting yanked to the north rather than moved to the east. So the weather systems tend to take on a bit more of a persistent, almost blocked nature here, given this highly amplified flow all the way out to next Thursday, it just keeps reinvigorating deep troughs here. So let's watch it all play out here in the operational European model. As I click play on this, let's just pause it right here. I've taken you all the way out to Saturday evening. You saw the trough coming in. You can see the low pressure starting to take shape here across the Intermountain West. And yes, there are chances for precipitation coming into coastal Oregon and California. Not a lot, but there's precipitation coming in. But the low is just now beginning to form here. Notice across the Great Plains, look at how strong these winds are going to be due to this tight pressure gradient. That's all a southerly wind, though, so very warm going through the day on Saturday. It will be on Sunday morning and afternoon that that low begins to start to really pull out of the mountains and head toward Manitoba. And here it is on Sunday afternoon, a strong low in this area. Now, at this point, you notice that much of the precipitation is north or on the back side. And this is where I'm expecting blizzard conditions in parts of Montana, southern Alberta, and southern Saskatchewan. With the warm air overrunning the warm front in through here, pay close attention to the potential for freezing rain right in this area, as well as some sleet. And then out ahead of this, as we go through the day on Sunday, now into Monday morning, as that warm moist air is drawn north and the front pushes through, we could start to see early next week some chances for storms in this area. Now here we are on Monday morning. Let's go from there into Monday afternoon and evening. Again, that's the corridor through which we could possibly see some thunderstorms. By the way, while all of this is happening, this is what Ada is doing. So it's still sitting here, not strong, but it's in this area. High pressure has really protected much of the east during this whole time period, hence staying relatively dry. But as we go into next Tuesday morning, Tuesday afternoon and evening, the frontal boundary sits right in through here, possibly some light snow on the back side of that. Let me just take you back and show you that. See it right there? But then as this frontal boundary gets swept a bit to the east, it could increase the chances of precipitation, parts of the Appalachian Mountains in mid-Atlantic getting into the Carolinas next Wednesday. But as you saw, another trough begins to take shape in the west. So by the time we get to the middle and end of next week, we're going to possibly be seeing another system ejecting out of the plains. And by this time, aid is still sitting here in the operational European run, which is why I said those the winds are really not going to be steering this system too much once it gets into the Gulf of Mexico, really just stagnant down here and not moving much at all. Okay, that's the operational European run. I would like to show you our threat of severe weather. So let's play this forward from our index we run here at Nutrien. 
I'm going to pause it right here. This is Monday morning, getting into the Monday afternoon and evening. So again, along that frontal boundary, just look out for the potential for some thunderstorm activity in this area, Monday afternoon and evening. And then as you get into the overnight hours on really Tuesday morning, working our way through midday Tuesday, as the front slides through, just again, keep an eye in this area for possibly some a narrow band of some showers and storms. Just wanted to keep you aware of that. From there, let's take a look at how the precipitation accumulates. Let's get this one going. And we'll pause it right here once we get through at the beginning of Saturday. So if you're in the midsection of the country trying to get some field work done, you still got a few more days here. This is Saturday morning. Let's just take you all the way through maybe Sunday morning. There it is. By Sunday morning, still a broad sector here, not seen much in the way of precipitation. So we still have another three and a half days where we're going to be dry in this area. But as the trough digs in, you can see that the band of heavy snow starting to take shape right in through this area, cutting through the Blue Mountains, the northern part of the Rockies here, and then coming out into parts of southern Alberta, Saskatchewan, and eventually to Manitoba. When does this wave really get out, though? It's going to be late in the day on Sunday. So if we go from there into Monday morning, this is what we've got. This is, excuse me, into Tuesday morning, Tuesday morning. So it's going to be a Sunday through Tuesday event. Here we can now start to see the chances for those scattered storms in this area. See it? But other than that, if you're over here, uh, you know, in the east, you're going to get through Tuesday relatively dry. This sector down here, dry. Parts of, um, you know, the northern plains, dry. And as we let this go all the way out, it's not going to be until that front really slides through late next week that we increase the chances of precipitation here. So that's it. That's really your next week's worth of rainfall right there from the European model. And the GFS has a little different solution, but overall it's quite wet in this area as well and gives the same path of snow into that region. So speaking of that snow, there is going to be a corridor in through here where the potential for 6 to maybe 18 inches of snow could fall. And remember, just to the south of this line, right in this area, I'm on the uh, lookout here for ice accumulation. We could pack it up in the Cascades and the Sierra Nevada and also bring some decent snow into the Rockies, which will be reinforced by another shot at some colder air uh, late next week. So probability of six inches, highest right in this area. Just want to point that out to you before we move on here. Week two, once again, troughs keep sweeping in following the flow which we discussed earlier, cutting into the northwest. They're not seeming to be able to break down the large ridge that's over the east. So what we end up getting is a precipitation pattern that's wet here, which is great given the drought situation, and wet here as the flow does something like that. Okay, that's your week two precipitation anomaly outlook. From there, let's talk temperatures. It's very warm today. We're going to be seeing temperatures getting in the mid to upper 70s here in the northern plains. In fact, the whole of the U.S. seems to be recording a warm bias today. Well, you know that's going to change starting in the west first. And so if we just take this out to Saturday, now we start to see the colder air coming down in the trough. But look at the warmth still here in the central plains. Well, the cooler air begins to advance east by the time we get into Sunday. Here's Monday's highs, Tuesday. And by Wednesday, the front has now swept through parts of the Midwest. So uh, up here in Montana, we're going to go from 70s back into the 20s with some overnight low temperatures there getting way down. Now that's going to take a couple of days, but let's talk about those overnight lows. Very warm today, also tomorrow, and getting into Saturday. Look at this. The overnight lows here in the mid-50s for the uh, 7th of, of November. That's just incredible. What I am concerned about, though, is going from Saturday into Sunday we're going to start to watch the Central Valley of California for some potential for some frost. So if I go from there into Monday morning's lows, here you go, you can now start to see there's going to be a couple areas in through here where the potential for getting those temperatures down below freezing exists. So I just want you to watch carefully uh, over the weekend and early next week for that because you can see again on Tuesday morning a very similar setup right here in pockets of the, the Central Valley of California. And that frost would be critical to watch this time of year. By the way, Montana going from upper 70s to having low temperatures on Tuesday morning in the single digits is going to put you on a pretty wild ride. Where do we go from here? Let's check out the day 5 through 10 pattern. This particular region is showing up with a, a really strong cold bias because of the snow, but you can tell overall that the pattern is really favoring that. So along the east coast, very warm conditions moving into the middle of this month. And taking you all the way out here now to day 10 through 15, the pattern once again is resetting with the colder air in place here, but the models have really moderated, bringing the warmer air back farther 
uh, to the west and to the north, stretching this out to all the way to the 20th of November. Now beyond that, I wanted to show you that the longer range models from the ECMWF here and the GFS here, taking us out to week three, which gets us all the way actually up to the day before Thanksgiving, are really trying to keep that pattern very much the same, very persistent with this pattern uh, as we check out here uh, toward the end of the month. From there, I would like to give you a quick update on the soil temperature numbers. Now remember, this map only has color coding where the soil temperatures are between freezing and 50 degrees. And as I animate it forward, what I want to watch for is if that band gets over a region where we do a lot of fall field work, including fall application of anhydrous. So if you kind of look right in through here, once we get out to the middle of this month, it appears that after the moisture returns, we could get some good field conditions in through this area to be doing some of that fall application. Just wanted to keep you aware of those numbers. From there, let's talk about what's going on in the tropics. The MJO seems to want to stall out, and you can tell that by looking that over the next 15 days, the regions for the best upper level support are kind of centered here over phase one and two. That's going to make good rising motion here over parts of the Brazilian rainforest as well, and also keep things favorable in the Caribbean should something else emerge out of the tropics. But let's keep an eye on Brazil first. Now, coming a little bit farther south, we do notice that in the next seven days, this area is showing up with a dry bias. So is Argentina. We're going to watch that very carefully. Argentina and southern Brazil, Uruguay and Paraguay. Into week two, we see that moisture returns to like Mato Grosso, Bahia, Tocantins, but stays dry down here in the latest model runs. And they've been looking like this for the past three days in southern Brazil in this section of Argentina. Now remember, as we look longer term, this La Nina in through here tends to favor those drier conditions in southern Brazil and Argentina. Has a less of an impact on uh, Brazil's main growing area here in like Mato Grosso, for example. And that La Nina is expected to continue to strengthen. One of the latest updates here, we'll get brand new data on this later on this week and next week, is we've kind of just pushed the strength of this to stay down here a little bit farther, not just in December, but now through January before it starts to recover next spring. We'll keep an eye on it, keep reporting back to you what the impact of this will be. But with that, I'll go ahead and wrap this one up and wish you all have a great end of your week and weekend. We'll talk to you again soon. Thanks.